There's no, no speed. speed control. Let's either full speed or off side. How do I balance that? Let us take the world as it is, and they're into you know compassion and right. kindness and right action. Right. This doesn't seem to have right action in it or a particular need for mindfulness. Yeah, mindfulness or compassion. Right. Which is kind. Hi. The other can of worms that I don't really want to bring up, but being a teacher is the bonding of the teenager with the cell phone and the reluctance to part, and that's a whole other thing. But you know, I, I joke with them there. You're going to be cyborg for the future. That phone is going to go right. I didn't keep the slide. I have a slide yeah. of a one and a half year old, and he's got a cell phone in front of him, yeah. and he's touching it and looking at it like he really knows what's going on there. But I mean, they refuse to part with that. Right. Steiner brought up something which I don't think anybody really follows, but he says, you shouldn't use this if you don't know what's going on. Because even that is a moral activity. Everything we do with our will has some moral implications. Now, as an environmentalist, you know every time you're using energy wastefully, you're, you're injuring the carbon footprint of the Earth. But is that all it is? So we're going to try to get into some of those things um, today, but these are they're absolutely, the questions you're asking is absolutely the forefront of where we are. This is the frontier. And these are deep moral questions. And your inner feelings are guides to the truth. But when we develop the consciousness soul, there are truths there that our total inner being, all our soul is screaming, that can't be. I totally reject that. And yet it is the truth. And the consciousness soul, as it starts reaching into spirit self, will grasp that truth, even though the soul revolts against it even though your feelings revolt against it. That's why you brought the verse, which we didn't do this today. We will. Okay. Because <laughs> you have to have courage to right. manage it. Well, there's two verses. The, uh, two, of course. Anything else? So, um, so I brought up this. To recap, so what you're saying is you're having, like in the soul, there's, there's feelings towards what's happening. And I understand, like, not moving into duality of good and bad, but you're saying there needs to be development of the moral um, fiber, the, mor the moral right. morality mm -hmm. that reaches mm -hmm. into the consciousness. Mm -hmm. Correct. That, um, that to, to understand what action or non action is. Correct. And, and this is one of the things that is taught in the Anthroposophy is that we have three actually four consciousnesses. We have our awake consciousness, where our thinking exists. We have a sleeping consciousness that our feelings are akin to. And we have the undreaming sleeping consciousness that is akin to our will. And then we also have coma state. <coughs> now, in our time, we will not reach that awakeness that we have in our everyday consciousness, in our will. But we have to start where we are and, or, and try to get into Practice. an awakeness of our will. And that's why these things are here. That's why these challenges are here. It's because it's, O oh man, mm -hmm. O oh human, know thou thyself. So we are then the crown of creation. We are the crown of creation in earth time. 
We are the, the stage where the drama is taking place. And Shakespeare knew this. You should have a Shakespeare conference. There's a wonderful book by name Mara Majoric called The Spiritual Shakespeare. Highly recommend it. There will be, there will be Shakespeare and Eurythmy and um, orchestra, I think. Um, Mark Levine is working on that with yes, a whole bunch Mark of Levine's people. So, so it, you know, there will be something like that, right. a tour across North America. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. Well, we talked about mythology preparing people for the future. How long ago was Shakespeare? 500, 400 years ago. 400 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Guess what? Some people, not all, but some people who were alive in Shakespeare's time and, and a couple hundred years after are incarnating today. Mm -hmm. What role did that Shakespeare have in preparing them? What role does it have in preparing people today? And these things are not insignificant. Okay. So we talked about robots today and a kind of similarity perhaps that they have to the Rakshasas, which were the beings who resulted from the race of Abel finding and taking lives from the race of Cain. And these two were supposed to stay separate and apart. And so by coming together and having offspring, they created beings that were much more powerful than other human beings. But at the same time, they were very easily seduced by evil forces, shall we say Lucifer, so that they corrupted Atlantis and caused the good spirits to bring Atlantis to an end. So are you um, knowledgeable about the, um, the, uh, the aeons in the uh, Gnostic Gospels? Uh, from the Nagamati Library and the work of uh, John Lamlash. Well, I don't know his work, but I do know about a lot from the, I, and I, I've been studying it. One of my other books I will write after this one is uh, Tracking the Ancient Mysteries from Egypt to the Founding of America. And uh, I will go yeah. into Nagamati and Gnostic texts and uh, the eons and the archons are related to the archai in the esoteric Christian traditions of the nine hierarchies. They are the time beings. And when an archangel is the time spirit, they step up a half step so that they can function like an archai during that 350 or so years that they are the time spirit. And this is the last, uh, Micah, we talked about the changing of the guard that's been going on since Earth began devolution. There are beings have completed their, their mission, and now they're moving on. And Michael is one of those who will move on to become an archive. So his role has to be taken place. And of course, there's all sorts of anthroposophical gossip about which angel is going to step up to be Michael's replacement? That's fun, you know. There's probably Facebook pages talking about that. So, what, what powers does an archon have? Archon? How do you spell it? Archon? Right. So, they are responsible for personalities and time. And so, all of these are known as spirits of something angels of twilight. And um, they have direct relationship to a human being, archangels to groups. So whenever you form a group, you have invited an archangel to participate with you. And then when you get to ethnic groupings or nations, something much larger where there's multiple interests, multiple groups here at the level of archive. Like A-R-C-H-I-I? 
AI. Okay, so here we are, um, and we're now, um, I've got one hour. <laughs> um, so I did try to, in this talk, get into your question, how are we going to handle sexuality some, but um, as I said, I've had to take out quite a bit in order to get it into an hour, you know, because I also want to talk about the God of Technology. He was married to Venus, so that's sexuality right there. That's right. So, Gabrielle, could you? Sorry. The stars once spoke to men. It is world destiny that they are silent now. To be aware of the silence can become pain for earthly men. But in deepening silence, there grows and ripens what man speaks to the stars. To be aware of the speaking can become strength for spirit men. So we've been working with this with each talk, and I hope each time you hear it, you're feeling in your thinking something that takes you deeper each time. I think this is just a wonderful verse for the times we're at and the subject that we're dealing with. All right, so can we become friends? <laughs> We'll take a look at artificial intelligence. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, indispensable condition of initiation that we should not wish things were otherwise. And I'm going to try to use the Socratic method here rather than saying A is B, but you might say why is A like B or something. So this robot came out two years ago and it was developed by a woman who wanted to humanize robotics. And she built a robot for family life. You can put it on your counter. It can roll around a little bit. Um, and you can ask it things like, dial Bessie's phone number, please. Or do you know where Michael is, our child, you know? Um, and, oh, I forgot the recipe for cornbread. Can you read it out for me? The family's all gathered. Can you take pictures of us? And they'll do all these things. It responds to these commands. So it has about three dozen functions like these that it can do, and it's always adding more. Would you buy one of these? Uh, I wouldn't. But now here's Pepper from a Japanese company. Pepper goes further. It can read your face. It has facial recognition software. And how you're holding your eyebrows or your cheek muscles, whether you're smiling or frowning, it can determine that. And so you come down in the morning, and it will say, Oh, Sally, I'm sorry you didn't sleep well last night. Can I pour you a big mug of coffee? I've got it ready already. <laughs> to poison you some more. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm reacting to what you just said there. Mm -hmm, me too. About that technology that you probably wouldn't buy. It. Um, like, where, where do we develop our morality in deciding what is useful for each of us? I mean, you're using a zipper, right? People resist.